Today's JJ Riddick podcast is brought to you by Belvedere Vodka. Produced in one of the world's longest running distilleries, Belvedere Vodka is the world's finest all natural vodka. Crafted by a collective of master distillers, Belvedere is made with non GMO Polish rye, pure water, and no additives. Recognized for quality, Belvedere was named the ISC World Vodka Producer of the Year in 2015, 2016, and 2017. Enjoy a delicious cocktail with Belvedere Vodka today, and remember to always drink responsibly. Welcome to this week's episode of the JJ Reddick Podcast. I'm very excited to have one of my favorite players of all time, Dirk Nowitzki, on from the Dallas Mavericks. We recorded our conversation in Shenzhen, China, uh, a few days ago, and I'm recording this intro and all of the reads from my apartment in Brooklyn. So if the audio sounds a little different, uh, that is the reason why. Um, got back from China yesterday. Um, like my previous two trips to China for the NBA China games, I had an awesome time. Uh, it was a it was a it was a great experience. Um, it was a little you know I got booed. Um, I got booed in both games, and and probably you know rightfully so. So, but um, you know I, I again I, I had a great time and really excited about the start of the season. Uh, one thing real quick about the Sixers, as the listeners probably know. Um, I'll be uh, starting the season coming off the bench, which is a little bit of a different role than I had last year. Um, Brett approached me about 10 minutes before our first training camp practice and and just brought up the idea of me br- bringing me off the bench and Markel starting. And, um, you know, we had a couple of subsequent conversations. And, and what I told him is that whatever's best for the team, and, and I'm totally fine with it and, and on board. And um, excited to have a, a another great season for for Philadelphia and another great season, hopefully personally. To my conversation with Dirk, real quick, was thinking about this as I was getting ready to talk to Dirk. And you know, for I think for an NBA player, you have like three stages of your career. And the first stage is when you're a young guy and you have sort of peak athleticism but you're still learning the game. Your mind is still growing. You're still learning the nuances of the game. Um, You're still rounding out your skill set. The second stage is your prime. And that's sort of when you're still in your prime athletically, your body is great. You've learned to take care of your body. You've learned to watch film. You understand the nuances of the game and your skills uh, are basically at an all-time high. Then that third stage, that last stage, um, is when your body starts to change. You can't recover as fast. Maybe you're not as quick. Maybe, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've lost a step or whatever it may be. Um, but your mind and your skills are at their sharpest and that's really where your advantage is. And, uh, Dirk is one of those players who has used his mind and his skills to a premium for the last few years. If you look, he played in 80 games last year, was an effective player at the age of 38. And I find it fascinating. I, I talk all the time about my conversation I had with Steve Nash as he was getting close to retirement um, with the Lakers. And, and I was approaching my age 30, my, my you know, sort of the other side of 30 and what changes I need to make. And, and now I'm 34 and I'm sort of I don't want to say I'm entering that third stage, but I'm transitioning sort of from that second stage of my career to the third stage of my career. And so these are the sort of things, you know, I want to think about and and, and hopefully play it at a high level for, you know, another three to five years. So having said that, uh, let's get to my conversation with uh, all-time great Dirk Nowitzki. Dirk, thank you for joining me on my podcast. Um, if I was to make a list of like probably top three to five basketball guests to have on my podcast, you would be on that list. You might be actually top, the top three or of the top list. five. What no, is it? Top, I'm say top three. <laughs> top three or top five. Oh, good. Uh, no, I really appreciate you doing this. So we are um, we are in Shenzhen. Uh, uh, this is our last day in China. Correct. Um, how was the trip been for you? 
pretty exhausting you know the the flight was was super long and um you know the the trip the other night from shanghai to shenzhen was brutal i mean i went to sleep at like 7 a.m so the traveling has been uh has been interesting and um but you know the good thing for me i'm not playing right now or uh so you know in shanghai I even went out a couple of times looked at a temple that was awesome and just trying to you know learn about the culture a little bit and uh spend some time with the with the fans here that you know, obviously love the NBA and are crazy about it. So um, it's been interesting, uh, but I'm also ready to go, go back home, see the kids and, uh, and get ready for the season. This is your first time over here for with, with the Mavs? How have yeah. you guys been here before? Because yeah, this, so, this is my third time. Oh yeah, no. So we've been. NBA I've games. been. Uh, I've been three times or oh, two times with the German national team. We've been okay. here in the Olympics in '08 gotcha. in Beijing. We were here for like over three weeks, and I was in '06. I was for some uh, for another national team. It's the first time with the math, so uh, it's kind of new, and um, it's uh, it's been fun though. I'm amazed every time I come here by the passion of the fans. I mean, it's it's really. I don't know if there's anything even like it in the States. I mean, yeah. you go to like an appearance or an event and I mean, I remember doing one with DeAndre Jordan and Doc Rivers and I felt like we were the Beatles. Like <laughs> it was, it was insane. Yeah. Um, the travel though is tough. The, just to give everyone just a, a little <clears throat> logistical sort of scenario, we played in Shanghai the other night and we couldn't stay in Shanghai after the game. So we had to go to the airport Made it through security, sat on the airplane for basically two and a half hours, did the hour and 45 minute flight to Shenzhen, deplaned, and then our you know, commute from the airport to the hotel. So everybody got into the, the hotel at like 6.15 in the morning. And when you're already not exactly adjusted, basically not sleeping for a night, it just sets you back. So I want to, so this is going to be a very blunt question. And I'm just going to ask you, and I actually had this conversation last night with JJ Berea about you, but wh why, why are you still doing this? You have nothing left to prove. You've, yeah. you know, you've made all the money in the world. You're a clear hall of famer. You won a championship. What is it now that's keeping you around? Well, one, uh, we have three little kids at home, so I'm, I'm trying to obviously <laughs> skid out of the house as much as I can. Uh, no, seriously, I just I just still enjoy the grind of it, uh, even though sometimes the summer workouts and especially this year, rehabbing every day uh, was uh, was a bit long, but I still enjoyed it. The season, you know, the the practices, the the film sessions, the joking around the locker room, the traveling, um, and then obviously the competing at the at the highest level. If I still can, if I still if I'm still able to help with, with my experience and. Um, so yeah i mean i almost played 80 games last year so my body held up okay so i was like hey I'll, I'll try one more year and we'll see how it goes so but like i said i'm i'm gonna miss this i'm gonna miss the the camaraderie i'm gonna miss the locker room and i'm gonna miss the, the competing at the highest level so these these things i, I still enjoy and, and try to you know have fun with it this last year and uh, see how it goes are you worried at all like about sort of i don't know i've talked to guys that have retired recently older friends of mine mike dunleavy shane battier and um the duke connection yeah you know the duke mafia is everywhere but no i think that like they always say to me it's it's really hard to sort of replicate that feeling of competition that feeling you get when you walk back in a locker room after a big road win and there's that euphoria in the locker room um and that's a that's a feeling that's really hard to replicate outside of actually playing the sport does that worry you at all because that's part of the drug that's what keeps us around yeah i think so um i think you find other things in uh in life you have passion for and um i don't know you know some guys pick up golfing uh or whatever the case may be i love tennis so i think i'm gonna, I'm gonna play a lot more tennis and maybe get my competitive uh, spirit in there um but yeah that's we're for sure gonna miss it i think the the first year, you know, the summer will be fine. We'll travel a bit. And then once September, October comes around and the camp, you're supposed to go to camp, but there's nothing coming. I think that's going to be extremely weird the first year or two. Um, but, you know, like I said, we have three young kids. I think I'm going to be extremely busy once, once I'm done. I'm, 
Uh, I want to be a very hands-on dad, obviously. And um, so they're going to keep me busy and I'll, I'll find some things that, uh, that I'd love to do to have passion in. I have two foundations. I have one in Germany, one in the U.S. that, uh, that I'm proud of and we're doing great work. So, you know, I have certain investments that uh, keep me busy. So I think there's plenty of plenty of stuff to do and uh, I'll just find stuff that, uh, that I love. And I'm sure the Mavs would love to keep me around once once I get a little break and I travel with my family. There's 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 certainly tons of opportunities, and uh, I'll I'll find my my niche after after I'm done. Are you planning on staying in Dallas? I think so. Dallas? You know, I've been there for for 20 years. I've yeah. been there as basically half of my life. Uh, got my network there. Wifey's has been there for almost 15 years. Um, so you know, she has her. She used to be in the art world, uh, so she has her art artsy people there and uh, have my basketball network and stuff so uh, i think we're going to make that our base and um but she's from originally from europe i'm from europe so we're going to travel a bunch in the summers when it gets really hot um in uh, in dallas where we're sure going to travel a bunch and see our families in the summers but um you know in, in the winter dallas will be our base like four years ago um right after my first season with the clippers ended i um I met Steve, your buddy Steve Nash, for mm -hmm. uh, for coffee, um, and uh, picked his brain a little bit about just sort of you know playing in the NBA on the other side of thirty, and um, gave me some great advice. But one of the things that really stuck with me was just as you get older, you have to sort of work almost less, work more efficiently. Um, and I'm curious about sort of your mindset as you've aged about your training because i know that you're you're a very diligent worker in terms of preparation getting your shots up but how has that sort of preparation changed over the last 10 years yeah well it's it's just a lot less on court stuff you know uh, i think in my 20s uh barely lifted weights uh, you know stretching was kind of secondary you know uh it was all on court stuff i mean i used to work a couple hours a day on the court i used to come back every off night and shoot for an hour hour and a half um and then once i got older in my 30s um you know it's, it's just less shooting less grinding on the court it's more other stuff it's it's massages it's whether it's acupuncture or it's you know the stretching whether it's uh it's weight lifting is big key especially in the summer you know you always kind of keep a certain base in your legs um so i think the work actually for me is almost kind of the same it's just a lot of other stuff that uh that i do now to, to kind of still play and, and still be effective so um it's yeah it's just a lot less grinding but it's, it's still a lot of work to kind of keep uh, keep doing what you do I had a conversation with Todd Wright, our strength coach, um, last week, and he basically said to me, you're 34 and you need to chill the fuck out. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> like, good advice. You are going to corkscrew yourself into the ground. And I, so it's like, I, I feel like, you know, I'm at that <clears throat> sort of a crossroads, you know, where you just and I have two young kids as well. I'm commuting back and forth between Philly and Brooklyn, and it just I just sort of am reaching a point now where I have to be more cognizant of like what I'm doing to my body, and and maybe maybe rest sometimes might be sort of the best work that I can do if that makes sense. Yeah. So when I was about, you know, we won the chip, and I was 32, 33, yeah. and then after that, I kind of felt it a little bit more and more. Uh, the next season was a lockout, and I was I was turning 34, and uh, then I, I really started to be uh, uh, find my way even a little more. What I have to do. Uh, rest a lot, massages. I uh, wasn't a huge fan of massage when I was younger, but uh, almost get worked on every day now, keeping keeping the muscles loose, especially here. The hip area gets so s silly tight. You know, it's <laughs> insane. Yeah, once I started to be 33, 34, I really had to take care of my body even more, even though, uh, you know, it starts even with diet, stuff like that. We didn't even know stuff like that 20 years ago. You know, we were eating chicken fingers and burgers pregame you know and all that changed uh, and and i try to be strict with that with no sugar and stuff like that obviously all all that stuff that uh raises the inflammation in your body so i mean it's it's a all-around package you try to do and uh you can still sort of play healthy and um late in your career beyond sort of the obvious we we're, we're sort of talking about these things right now but you know 
uh, your diet, taking care of your body, being diligent about your preparation and working on your skills. Those are sort of the obvious things. But um, as you sort of look back on your 21 years in the NBA, and you played four professional years in Germany, is that right? Yeah, a sort of. I think sort I started of. When I was okay. like 16. All right. Yeah. So 25 years, let's call it, of professional basketball. Are there any keys to longevity outside of the obvious things? Like, what has kept you playing at such a high level for so long? There's got to be something going on in your brain that just makes you tick. <laughs> well, you know, you got to love the grind, that's for sure. But, I mean, yeah, most of the stuff is, is the obvious that you talk about, and that's, that's taking care of your body. And uh, part of it is being a little lucky, you know. I didn't have any major injuries, uh, knock on wood, you know. I had I had a few surgeries, but all of them were, were pretty minor. I had a knee scope, I had two ankle scopes. But really, other than that, I was, uh, I was really, really fortunate. You know, there's there's so many great players. I mean, we just saw Yao Ming the other day who had to retire at age 28. Yeah. I mean, you know, for, for no wrongdoing on his, on his behalf. So, uh, it's just, I was, I was fortunate. That's uh, that's a huge part of it, and then uh, the work you put in—that's for sure. And so I don't think there is uh, there is any specifically, you know, reason or uh, or not obvious reason. Do you think it's an advantage for guys like me and you that don't jump very high? Yeah, I mean, you know, we know how to play without being athletic. I think that's uh, that's definitely part. Thank you. Yeah, we're uh, we got to use our skill a little more. Uh, if, if the, and and obviously, when you're skilled, your game ages better. That's yeah. that's part. You know, when when you're a high jumper and you lose it with 34, 35, or whatever, and then uh, you're not as athletic. Uh, you know, and you're not really that skilled. It's going to be tough to hang around. So I think we're. Or def our age or our game definitely ages better. That's that's another reason. But all these are pretty pretty obvious. I can't yeah. tell you. Uh, something I feel there. like we got to give a shout out to Vince Carter, by the way. Oh yeah, who's forty one, still hooping, and still doing three sixty dunks and warm ups yeah. every night. Incredible. You know, I played with Vince for a, I think it was two seasons and yeah, I played with, with him us. for a season and a half in yeah. Orlando. Yeah, yeah, good dude. I love him a lot. And you know, we were drafted in the same draft, so kind of happy he's around. We still kind of stay close because you know, the surgery I had this summer, he had a couple years ago on his bone spurs in his ankle. So we kept in touch and I kept asking him questions how long it's going to take. And uh, so he's one guy uh, I lean on a lot, and he's he's got obviously plenty of experience and. Man, he was uh, he was the greatest dunker of all time in game. I mean, a uh, uh, huge, huge, huge Vince fan. One of the other sort of interesting things about your career, your longevity, twenty one years, uh, is the fact that you played for one team, and um, it's very rare that that happens. And you go down the line of of guys that have done that. You know, it's Kobe, Tim Duncan, not twenty one years, but you know, their mm-hmm. whole careers. Reggie Miller. Um, Nick Collison with one franchise, <laughs> um, and and I'm I'm like I'm thinking about this, and I'm trying to figure out sort of common threads in those scenarios. Like what what were the common threads that allowed these players to play for one franchise their whole career? You know, was it ownership? Was it was it coaching front office? Was it the player themselves? I mean, it just seems like, especially now in today's NBA, like. The fact that Mark Cuban and Donnie never traded you and never cash in on you for younger assets and draft picks is it's remarkable. It actually is remarkable that 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 never happened. What do you think it it's been that allowed you to be with one team for twenty one years? There's got to be some. In other words, there's got to be some give and take. I think both from the player side and and from ownership and and front office. Yeah. Well, when I first got there, obviously didn't really know what to expect. I uh, think. Uh the the second year with Mark buying the team was uh, was huge for me. You know, he's uh, he's been a friend of mine basically. I mean, I tell the story all the time when uh, when I got married and had a bachelor party and Mark Mark came on my bachelor party. I mean, how many <laughs> how many owners are rolling? You know, with uh, with with their franchise player on the, to parties. So uh, that's that's the sort of relationship we had from day one. You know, uh, we. He's uh, he's been really loyal to me. I've had some off the court issues uh, where he was always stepping in and and was the first one to 
to help me. Um, so he's just been a, a great friend of mine. And then, you know, just the community in, in Dallas has been, has been great to me, you know, from my first year where I was really struggling. I tell this all the time. There was even games where I didn't come in at all. You know, uh, we had a, a, a good team, and um, so then when I did get subbed in, I used to get a standing ovations in my in year one. And I was like, that made me think like uh, this 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 community here, these people, these fans really want me to succeed here, and and I want to make everything possible to to pay them back and make this work, pay their loyalty back. And uh, so it was a it was an all around package. Plus, we, then once Mark took over, he made us a, a world class friend. Franchise, you know, he bought a new arena. He bought us a new plane to stop chartering, and you know, we started staying in really, really nice hotels. So he he put Dallas back on the map, basketball wise. He he made it a, a franchise to to uh, you know to be again, and where where free agents wanted to come and play for. And I think uh, Dallas basketball owes uh, owes Mark a lot because there were some rough years in the '90s, and even when I got there, the first couple of years were rough. But uh, yeah, Mark definitely turned it uh, turned it all back around and, and made it a franchise to be again. So, so the community, Mark, and then you know Donnie, we've we've been going way back with Donnie as well, and um, we've just had great great relationships. And um, you know they were always loyal to me. It was always easy for me to be loyal back. All right, we're gonna take a quick break with Dirk and hear from our sponsors. A room filled with heroes. Dan hands us. Greg Rosenthal, Chris Wessling, and Mark Sessler of the Around the NFL podcast deliver all the latest news in the NFL. As NFL writers and reporters, the ATN crew has exclusive access to industry insiders and team personnel, allowing their listeners to feel in on all of the action. The ATN podcast has you covered 52 weeks a year, recapping every game and every big story, even in the offseason. If it happens in the NFL, you will hear it on ATN. As the NFL preseason unfolds, stay up to date with the latest storylines affecting your favorite players and teams by following along with the ATN podcast three times a week, whether it's a buzzworthy position battle, a new addition to the injury report, or perhaps a rookie stealing the show around the NFL highlights everything you need to know ahead of kickoff 2018. Subscribe now to the around the NFL podcast and keep up with all 32 teams all year long available on your favorite podcast app or NFL.com. Thanks to two years of research and development and multiple improvements in design, performance, and comfort, Bombas are the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. That is quite the statement. With an arch support system that provides extra support where you need it most and a cushioned footbed that's reinforced for comfort without added bulkiness, Bombas feel like a hug around your foot. Not to mention, Bombas Stay Up technology ensures that your socks stay in place without leaving a mark. That is literally one of my least favorite things about socks is that when they drip down and they just pool at the bottom of your ankle, it drives me crazy. And the super soft cotton material makes you never want to take them off. So whether you are a runner, power walker, or power lounger, there's a pair of Bombas that'll add comfort to your life. I got a shipment of Bombas recently and they were the most comfortable socks I've ever worn. I threw out all of my other socks, except for Adidas. I have to say that. I kept my Adidas. <laughs> I have to say that. These socks feel like you're you're stepping on like the most cushioned velvet carpet. Go to bombas.com slash reddick. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash reddick. Use the promo code reddick, R-E-D-I-C-K for 20% off your first order. That's Bombas, B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash Reddick, code Reddick, R-E-D-I-C-K, and you'll get 20% off your first order. Get the socks. And now back to my conversation with Dirk Nowitzki. Loyalty. It's very rare, though. There's a saying that we always say uh, amongst some of our friends in the NBA, the game is the game. And, you know, as players, you're, you know, at times you can feel sort of like an asset on a piece of paper and you're expendable. Um, obviously the great ones are in a different category, um, mm-hmm. like yourself. Do you think that, uh, when you look back on sort of <clears throat> your, your career in Dallas in terms of, uh, in terms of championships uh, or missed opportunities for championships, are there any, are there any seasons, obviously probably 06, 07, when you guys won 67 games, are there, are there any seasons that sort of stand out for you that were missed opportunities? Well, there was a few. It started. We had a really fun team, and uh, 
in I think it was 03 we had Nick Van Ex we had Mike we had Steve I was actually I came to one of your playoff games against Sacramento that year I oh, think yeah. you played him in the first round I can't remember I sat courtside for the game oh yeah yeah it was amazing and yeah Nick 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 had a huge game yeah Nick was amazing back then he was really a point guard that was unstoppable on the block so we used yeah. to post him all the time and uh I still love Nick I see him all the time and um, so that was a great season uh, we had. First round, actually, we beat Portland in seven. We were up 3-0 and almost lost. And then second round, we beat Sac in seven. And then we played San Antonio in the Western Conference Finals. And um, we steal game one in San Antonio. They win game two. And then in game three, it was, we were a little down, but uh, I was like, there was a, a play, and I kind of reached for the ball. And Ginobili kind of chopped me in, in the knee, and then I uh, strained my, I sprained my MCL, and then I missed the rest of the that series, which which was tough. I mean, I don't know if he would have gotten by San Antonio, but that was a fun group. Man, we had we had a blast that year playing with each other, and you know, Steve and, and Nick always, you know, sharing the ball and shooting from everywhere. That's that was the first team that I loved playing with, and. And, um, I don't know what would have happened. Maybe we would have had a shot at it because then I think San Antonio won the chip uh, that year against New Jersey, I want to say, yeah. which we probably would have beaten as well. So uh, that was that was a missed opportunity, unfortunately. Uh, and then 06 comes to mind. You know, We were up 2-0 against Miami, had a great run there in the playoffs. I mean, I mean that was that was common knowledge, but the the mayor put uh, the parade route in in Dallas Morning News in the newspaper after we went up two all. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never so, knew that. so basically, uh, we were all hyped already, and then we go down there and uh, we lose a close game three, which could have gone either way, and then just the wheels came off. I mean, we were, we were rattled. We we're a younger team. I wasn't uh, that experienced in that situation, and. Uh, uh, we end up getting blown out in game four, lose another tie one in game five, uh, which we, we changed hotels in the middle. Avery was losing it. He's like, there's too many people here in the, in the hotel, too much family. So we moved out to Fort Lauderdale, like 45 minutes away. Uh, this is back when the this, series was 2-3-2, two, two, right? Yes. So you would exactly. go. We were there yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for a whole week, basically. Uh, so after, was it after game four? I think he moved this out to Fort Lauderdale. Uh I mean, just uh, the memories were insane, and then uh, ended up losing a really tight game five, and then uh, come home, we're up 20 in the first half, uh, and ended up losing that game too. So uh, that year always stands out to me. That was a great opportunity, but you got to give Wade credit. He played, that was his coming out party. He played an amazing series, and uh, he really willed them to, to win. So uh, that was a tough one. And then we're hyped we're hyped going next year the next year is going to be our year you know uh we start the season off 0 and 4 and go on for 67 and 11 basically after that uh we're rolling we had san antonio's number that year we beat them i think three out of four we're like this is our year we're hyped um and um yeah and now uh, we end up running in the gold state, which Nelly obviously was our old coach. He knew exactly how to play us, yeah. you know, played small balls, fronted me on the block. Every time I turned, there was a second or third guy coming. He knew the game plan inside out, and uh, they, were, they were hot on top of everything. You know, Baron Davis made like buzzer beaters in every game off the glass from half court. And uh, they were great, and uh, they, they got us. They had a perfect game plan, and, and they beat us. So um, those two years were probably the most frustrated I've been. And, and, you know, when you're in that situation, you know, you had a good team. You're like, oh, we'll be there in the finals now every year coming up. And then just stuff started to change. Other teams get better and uh, you lose a step. And uh, and then uh, it's just and then you go through a few years and you wonder, am I, am I, gonna, am I ever going to get back to the finals, you know? So it's uh, it's been a couple of rough years there from well, six or seven to all the way to to eleven until we actually finally won it. So there's always you know missed opportunities and uh, but oh six and oh seven I'll definitely think of the most. There's a moment uh, in 2011 when you guys win, everybody's celebrating, and you kind of went off on your own. Uh, back to the locker room, I assume. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I, whenever I've envisioned myself, and I, it obviously hasn't happened in, in 12 years, but whenever I've envisioned 
being on a team that wins, like I always envisioned sort of having to take that moment by myself. And, um, and what was, what was the reason behind that? What was sort of going through your mind at that moment? So I had, when I started, I had two huge goals. One was making the Olympics and the other one was winning the championship in the league. And, uh, so when we, when I finally reached a dream in 08 to make the Olympics, like the last couple minutes, I felt this weird feeling in my body. And then the, the game was over. We beat Puerto Rico for the last spot in the Olympics. And just everything came crashing down on me. You know, I was hugging my teammates and I was I was sobbing uncontrollably. And uh, that was really a weird situation for me. So it's just, a, it was almost like an out-of-body experience. So in 11, you know, that kind of when the game was sort of wrapped up the last couple minutes and I felt the same thing coming on again. And I I was like, I'm not about to stand here and just, you know, just fall everywhere. So I was like, I'm going to sneak out. I'm going to get a couple minutes to myself in the back. So as soon as the buzzer uh, rang, I, I ran to the back there. And, you know, and then Miami in the in the visiting locker room, there's this in the shower and there's a little uh, bench there by off the shower. And I just lay down there for a couple minutes and just everything that, that goes through your mind, you know, the, the, the work of the people that supported you and, you know, the, the million failures before, all that stuff goes through your mind. You just, you just lay there and, and our PR guy that I love uh, followed me back there. And uh, one of the PR guys from the league, it was actually Tim Frank, who's the head of the PR now, uh, he followed, they both followed me back there. And they're like, hey, you got to come out. You know, you're getting the trophy. I was like, I don't want it. You know, leave me alone. I want to just lay here by myself. And um, so I, I was, after a couple minutes, they, they talked me, you know, hey, that's the picture you want to have. You want to you see that picture in 20, 30 years of you holding that trophy. So you, you got to come out. So after a couple minutes, I got myself together and I came back out. And, and obviously now I'm, I'm glad I did. And, I was actually okay. Well, once, once I got those couple minutes out, and um, I was, I was fine to, to really go through the trophy presentation and enjoy it, and and, and get the finals MVP and all that was, uh, was an amazing feeling. But I needed, I just needed a few moments to myself. It really, I'm being serious when I say this. It's one of my, like in my 34 years. So I started watching sports when I was seven. My 27 years of watching sports, it's probably. In my top three or five favorite moments. <laughs> ah, cheers. <laughs> it's called Thanks. a callback. It's called yeah. a callback. You, I, I went through literally every roster you've ever been on. Oh, wow. Okay. You did some research. No, there. And this is, so you've obviously, you played with some really talented teams, mm -hmm. some really talented guys, um, including, you know, guys like Michael Finley, Nash, um, Josh Howard, mm -hmm. guys who made all-star teams. But you've never, I, I would at least make this argument, you've never had a big three. You've never, you know, you never were on a team with uh, LeBron, uh, D-Wade, Chris Bosh, you know, KD, well, they have a big four, uh, you know, KD, Steph, Clay, Draymond. Mm. Um, was there any, was there ever any talks with uh, you and Mark or, or Donnie just about, you know, getting sort of that big three, especially like from 08 on? after the Celtics got Ray, KG, and Paul, you know, was there ever any talks about you guys sort of orchestrating things to get a big three? Yeah, I mean, we, we always try to get better. I mean, that's, that's not a secret. We traded for Jay Kidd, I think, in 08. Um, for, we traded away Devin, and then, uh, you know, we didn't really uh, pan, all, pan out right away. And so we're, our franchise wanted to get better. We lost, I think, in the first round one year against New Orleans, and we lost in the second round again. So, you know, we, we always want to get back to, we wanted to get back to the finals and, and obviously win it all. So I never wanted to be that involved. I wanted, I didn't really want to be the guy when somebody gets traded. They're like, oh, you know, Dirk obviously knew about this and this. And so I always, maybe to my default, I always wanted Mark and, and Donnie to kind of run the show. So I put my faith in them and uh, they're both good friends and, and good people. So I always said, hey, uh, let those guys do their thing. And, and, and I know they have our best interests at heart. And um, so, you know, they, I always uh, had faith in them that they were going to come through and put the game, best product out there for, for our franchise. And um, so that's uh, that's how I looked at it. And you got to say, we, we just got a little lucky there in 10-11, you know, to, to run it in Miami, that team. 
uh, with full of full of Hall of Famers. Uh, but we just had a ripe mix that year, you know, which was lucky too. You know, we just traded for Tyson Chandler, who's basically missed a year and a half because he had toe surgery. Yeah, toe injury. Yeah. Um, so you know, we we didn't know if he was even going to play or be a factor at all. And and just and we signed Page in the middle of the year, who ended up being unbelievable for us, making shots and. Uh, you know, we just had a great, great chemistry. We had an older group that kind of fit together uh, and had fun uh, playing off each other. Um, but, you know, I think eventually we would have loved to have our own big three. But, you know, we, we did we did along the year when we had cap room. Uh, we, we did some uh, some recruiting. We tried to get Melo one year. We tried to get DeAndre the first time. Uh, when we had him from you guys, uh, we tried. Where were uh, you when that was happening? Were you in the United States or were you uh, uh, over, overseas? I, I think I was traveling at that time. Okay, yeah. yeah, I was traveling. I usually July, August is usually the time that we travel to Europe when it gets too hot. So I think I was there. But, you know, guys could try to keep me informed. And, and, uh, and then I think Cuban was there. I mean, it was that was a big mess. Still um, up in the air, whether he was in Houston or was not in Houston. Yeah, actually, I don't know about <laughs> yeah, that. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, I didn't really get that involved since 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 I was gone. Uh, who else? Oh, we tried to get Dwight that uh, one year. I mean, we I think literally tried to get CP and Dwight together at yeah, one point. I don't know. It's just you know, we always kind of struck out, which which I'm not sure if uh, we we had to analyze. You know, why is it that every summer we we can't get anybody? Is it is it me? Is it the franchise? Is it the coach? Coaches, is it? You know, if you know, if you constantly don't get free agents, I think as as a franchise, you need to look in the mirror and say, well, what's going on? We're a great market. We're a big city. So we need to do some analyzing. But uh, we we tried, we tried, and I feel like there was didn't work. There was also some teams like in the mid two thousands where you guys kind of swung for the fences a little bit. I mean, there was a team with like Antoine Jameson, and I know at one point Antoine Walker was on the team. Jerry yeah. Stackhouse, Nick Van Exel. I mean, you had a cast. You had a cast, cast of characters. Yeah, there really was, talented guys. That yeah, came there through. was. Uh, there was a year that was. I think that was still on the Nelly. Um, and just we had a chance. We had we 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 got Antoine Jameson. And um, we were supposed to kind of play together. And then sort of right before the season, we had a deal on the table and uh, it was for Anton Walker. And, and they were like, hey, if you can add a good player to a good team, you, you have to go for it. So they went for it. And I got to say, looking back, that was one of my tougher years because all of, of us were four men. None of us were five men or right. three men. So they tried to play us together some. That didn't work because, you know, Antoine Jameson wasn't really a three-point shooter like that. So he was kind of needed to be close to the basket. So then they tried to play two of us together. That didn't really work well. And then Jameson ended up coming off the bench. And that was a rough year. That was a rough year for us. And we still made the playoffs, won 50-something games. But uh, unfortunately, that year actually led to, to Steve's departure, you know, because we ended up losing to sack pretty clear i think it was 4-1 i didn't really have a shot bibby was killing that series and uh and so mark made the decision hey i think steve's breaking down you know he's uh he didn't look good in the playoffs and that was that year and so so mark ended up or not not matching what what phoenix offered or didn't even come close to it right and uh, and let Steve walk, which uh, which obviously now he finally admitted, probably ten years later, that he made a mistake. But you know that's uh, that's unfortunately the nature of the game. We just uh, he just read that wrong, and um, and uh, obviously Steve turned into one of the greatest point guards ever. About a month ago, Don Nelson, the coach, uh, said that um, you and Steve became buddies over basically drinking beer. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a website, by the way, called? Uh, I think it's called drunkathlete.com. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a few. So I, back when I was at Duke, uh, I think I had a few pictures up there. And in the early 2000s, there was a few pics of, yeah. uh, of you and Steve. The good old times. At what looked like country western bars. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. like th This is like old school NBA. Like There used to be beer in the locker like There's not beer in the locker room now. Yeah, there's, no. there's, you know high nutrient d density smoothies and, yeah. and recovery bars and that's what's in the locker room now but back in the day it was uh you know it was a it was a cooler full of beer after the game yeah for sure i mean especially with with old nelly i mean yeah 
you know, there was one time he got kicked out in the first half, and by the time we got to the locker room at halftime, he was already blitzed. <laughs> I mean, he used to he used to keep the beers around. It was uh, those great memories. But uh, I drank a little bit there in my twenties during the season. But all those pictures more from from the summertime when yeah. we really let loose and had a lot of fun. And you know, it's I think it's normal. We were in our twenties. We we're enjoying life, and um, unfortunately, that's the time where everybody had f- camera phones. You know. I think yeah. you know the the MJs and all these people. They had they had a good time back then. I'm sure. Uh, just not everybody had had camera phones back then. But unfortunately, that was just the time that everybody had their phones on them. But yeah, I mean it's part of part of life, part of enjoying it, part of uh, you know just growing up and learning from uh, from some of the mistakes. But um, they're not yeah. mistakes. Yeah, I mean they're, you have to go. Mistakes. Yeah, have to go through <laughs> some stuff in, in life to to learn and. Um, that was uh, those were the good old times. I mean, Steve and I kind of bonded because we're he has a European background. So yeah. when I first got there, he just got traded there. He played two years in Phoenix. I got there fr- brand new from Germany, so I didn't know anybody. He didn't know anybody there, and so we just, just started hanging out. Had a, he had a European background, he loved soccer, you know. So we started bonding over that. Started watching soccer games together, and uh, and that was it. I mean, just developed a great relationship and. Uh, and to this day, we're uh, we're good friends. So he helped me a lot. You know, at the beginning, I was in my hotel room. I was homesick. Uh, he always called me. You know, let's go out. Let's go to movies. Let's go eat. Let's go do this. Meet my friends here on the road. And uh, he was he was vital to my uh, to my success uh, in my first couple of years. Another one of my all time favorite players. Do you? This is my last question for you, and I because I, I want to be cognizant of your time. But um, I, I'm not playing today. You got to play. Yeah, <laughs> I got to go to our team meeting in a second. But you mentioned the two goals you had right at the beginning of your career: getting Germany to the Olympics, winning an NBA championship. In both those cases, they happened, and when they happened, there was this you know run of emotion that occurred. Have you ever sort of thought about your last game and what? what that's going to be like not really because i kind of want to leave the end open a little bit you yeah. know I, i'm i'm approaching this like there's no tomorrow this year and i'm gonna just go for it and leave it all out there and then uh we'll see i guess again next summer see how i feel so there's not really one scenario that uh that i have in mind um but you know if it does happen this year and down the stretch and I can kind of feel this this is going to be it I think it's going to be really bizarre really emotional you know a couple of years ago uh, we had the European Championships in uh, in Berlin and I kind of knew that that was going to be it for the national team I was 36 37 at the time and we ended up losing that game like almost at the buzzer basically Mr. Free to retire but in my head, I already knew I'm not going to play national team again. So this was the last game. And it was at home in Berlin in front of a sold-out crowd. And that was an, an unbelievable moment. So everybody kind of knew, hey, this might be it. In my head, I knew it was it. So I kind of did an interview off to the side. And then I was just going to walk back on the court, say thanks to the, to the crowd and leave. But at this point, my whole team had already left by the time I was finished with the interview. So when I came back out, it was just me in this packed house. Everybody stayed, and then they all gave me a standing ovations, and uh, I got I got super emotional. You know, that was you couldn't have basically uh, made up a better final game and uh, for the national team. You know, basically, even though that in those Euros I was horrible. I was I was too old for five games in six <laughs> days. You know, I was I wasn't playing well at all. But basically, they were saying thanks for the entire whatever fifteen years I played yeah. national team and uh that was that was an incredible moment i don't think i can necessarily duplicate that but that that was uh that was an amazing moment i'll I'll never forget amazing all right dirk thank you for the time really appreciate it thank you and uh genuinely seriously one of my favorite players ever (laughs) appreciate appreciate you man thanks for having me all right all right thanks again to dirk thank you to all the listeners for listening to this week's episode of the jj reddick podcast As always, I really appreciate it. I will be back soon. I've got a couple guests lined up over the next month and looking forward to getting some new episodes out. Talk to you soon.